Assalamu alaikum. This podcast was brought to you by Seekers Guidance. Support us in spreading free, reliable Islamic knowledge to millions around the world by becoming a monthly supporter. Make a small donation at seekersguidance.org forward slash donate. As little as $10 a month can go a long way. Okay, what's the strongest position regarding the revelation of Surah Al-Najm? Uh, where the non-Muslims prostrated with uh, with the Muslims. Uh, yes, uh, the strongest position is that the Muslims prostrated. That the the end. There's a very eloquent surah, especially the last verses. There's a lot of um, you know dramatic tension. You could say there's a lot of the, the, the um, a build up of many strong arguments, and then the last verse is a verse of prostration and the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam when he recited it for the first time uh, he went into sajda the sahaba and the non-muslims uh, the idolaters they all went into prostration because of the power of it so that is the accurate uh, narration uh, uh, re- regarding that verse there are the, what you call the satanic verses and i believe if you go back to if you go back to the sira class that uh, we have uh, um, <clears throat> the prophetic life in, in focus. Um, I I discussed that in detail in the Meccan period. It should be uh, mentioned in the uh, this description of the video. I did discuss that in detail <coughs> and discussed the rational and the uh, the technical proofs of the invalidity of the <clears throat> the satanic satanic verses. Uh, firstly, uh, this briefly. It doesn't make sense, right? Because uh, what are the satanic verses? They say that, um, firstly, these these narrations have no basis. There's no chain of narration. We talk about the Sahih. This is like fabricated. There's no chain of narration uh, going all the way back to the Sahaba who would have seen it. So it's a lie. <coughs> Secondly, what was said in the narration, it says, uh, uh, the, the Quran says, أَفَرَأَيْتُمُ اللَّاتَ وَالْعُزَّةِ Have you seen اللَّاتَ and الْعُزَّةِ have you, have you seen Allah and Uzzah is criticizing the idols? And that other one, Al Manat. So the context and the wording is of critique and critique and criticism. So, and then they say Shaitan came and he said something and made the Prophet say, That they are the lofty uh, swans and their inter- intercession is hoped for no the prophet did not say that why because we know from the end of surah al-jinn that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that whenever revelation came the prophet was surrounded by angels the devil couldn't get near him let alone make him say something so that's that secondly just look at the context of the verse he's saying have you seen allah and uzza and that other one uh manat is clearly criticism how can you go in what's considered to be the pinnacle of Arabic eloquence, how can you go from you know, crit- criticism to praise straight away of the same subject in the same paragraph, you know, in the same flow of the conversation? It's just not good style. It doesn't make sense. So therefore, it's, you know, they were a fabrication. So the satanic verses are just wrong. It's a fabrication. And, you know, also with the, also the hadith science disproving uh, you know the 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 claimed narration that they came from the Sahaba, and they have no basis. So <coughs> it's it's it, you know it was a fabrication. Uh, so they said that when the idols when the idolaters heard those, they prostrated because of them. No, it's false. So that's the dominant position. Is seeing the ijaz of the Quran possible through deep study? Absolutely yes. Absolutely yes. You know, <clears throat> I grew up in Yorkshire right you know I didn't grow up in Arabia or anywhere like that I, Alhamdulillah Allah blessed me with the study of the Arabic language I studied Nahu, Sarf, Balagha I studied Arabic uh, you know literature, Adab, poetry, prose <coughs> and, and then Tafsir and you know it's very clear when you're reading the Quran and you know it's a skill that you pick up your mastery of Arabic, the more you master the language, the more you master tafsir and the Quranic style, the more you'll notice a disparity between the quality of the Quranic text and anything else in Arabic. Just the style, the simplicity of the language, but the extreme beauty that comes with it is just really, you know, really, you know, beautiful. 
right? So the i'jaz, which means the, the miraculous aspect of the language of the Quran, yes, anyone who studies properly can see this. It helps if you have uh you know if you have a passion for language and if you have you know people are more some people are more mathematical or more, more scientific and some people are more rhetorical right and if you have a passion for languages and you know you like reading poetry and these sorts of things it will make your journey quicker your appreciation will be a lot quicker but it's it's very possible very very possible um a couple of years a couple of years ago and i mean i taught through little kothar uh one of the students <clears throat> he listened to the uh, he listened to the the class, and you know, in a in a in a question later, he said, after listening to that class, I can definitely see yes that uh, <coughs> the Quran cannot be imitated just from Surah Al Gawthar. And so the the beauty and the miracle of the Quran. Yes, there are books on its analysis. What is Ijaz? What is the miraculous aspect of it? How is it? And they might give you a few. Uh, a few examples um, but real mastery of Arabic and Arabic literature and then you know understanding the Quran what it's saying it, it, you can certainly get there there have been times uh, there have been uh, there was a time when I was teaching um, I was teaching to read to someone and the student was quite advanced and he was reading uh, Surah Yusuf uh, which basically uh, talking about the brothers of Yusuf, they all, after he refused to give Binyamin back to them, they all went, najiyya. they went for a, this najwa, this private discussion. And you can imagine the situation, it's a calamity for them, and they need to find a solution. And there's all these people around them, and you know they know now that they can't uh, get their brother back easily. So what do they do? They want to get away. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala used the word wa khalasu. And uh, so this, uh, the root word you know, is from ikhlas, which means to remove impurities, like <coughs> the beeswax uh, was, was removed in the past from the honey, you know, the beeswax from the honeycomb that was removed. So you just have pure honey and nothing else. So them wanting to leave uh, everyone else and just be them on their own, the brothers on their own to discuss this matter. He expressed it with the, with the word khalasu. And explaining it like this, you know, it may not have an impact on you, but when you're reading it and it hit, he was reading it and it hit me like, wow, I said, stop. I had to make him stop because of the effect of it. It's just like you're filled with this sense of awe and wonder, like, wow just how has this happened even if you know it and you can break it down in a scientific you know a scientific level and just its impact is just very strong so yes the ijaz of the quran can can be uh, be perceived and i'll be honest with you most people struggle when they're learning arabic the sarf becomes too difficult or the nahu becomes too difficult they lose focus and you know and you know alhamdulillah i didn't feel any of this why because one question that was spurring me on was how i want to see you know how is the quran miraculous i want to see this you don't see mountains turning into gold you know casually you know you're walking around the street casually right it you know miracles are not an everyday <clears throat> event in the life of most people but there is a miracle that could be there in your life every day it's the quran <clears throat> but it requires training to be you know worthy you know to, to see it right so that's where the arabic language comes in is playing normal card games allowed so without gambling and also what about chess <clears throat> okay so generally yeah card games would be allowed <clears throat> but let's have this discussion on uh, it's permissible to engage in a mubah, a, a permissible activity, for example, for stress relief, or for for building relationships. Let's say you have a younger brother, or with your spouse, you know, you you know, you, let's say you play chess with them, for example. Uh, although there has been discussions, and some of the madahib and in the Shafi school is permissible, you know, um, with conditions. So in this situation, if it's got a wider purpose such as you know stress relief or just unwinding so you can be fresh to worship allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, in in these situations like a card game 
uh, without any gambling involved. Yes, that would be permissible. The same thing with uh, with chess, right? In this situation, um, as long as as long as it doesn't uh, the activity doesn't involve anything you know lewd or impermissible. So I'm talking about something broader, not just these games. And as long as uh, it doesn't lead to neglect of your prayers. So you know, I was speaking to I was speaking to a scholar this morning and he was talking about um you know he, he plays uh mario kart with his son <laughs> uh you know on the weekend and you know there's nothing lewd or impermissible there and it's a halal activity he's building a bond with his child so in that situation as well it with the same condition as long as the prayers are not skipped uh, or not missed because some people get so engrossed into it in the past that's what uh people found that you know, people playing chess got so engrossed into it, they neglected their prayers. So generally, you know, yes, it would be permissible. However, there is a, there is a bit of a discussion on um, uh, on activities that are considered a waste of time in the Hanafi school. So if there's a wider benefit, you know, made preserving relationships or winding down stress relief, something like that, yes, it would be permissible as well. Okay. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Okay, a question. If a man wrote down a statement of divorce uh, in front of witnesses, uh, his wife asks, he, he asks his wife for money, uh, and uh, he asks his wife for money, and uh, she said, give me a divorce and I'll give you money. So technically this is classed as a khula, um, <clears throat> or type of a khula, or a divorce in exchange for money. So if he said, I divorce you, if he wrote, I divorce you, and he gave it to her, uh, in exchange for money, yes, it's a valid divorce. Um, she's divorced. <coughs> Saying that he's not in his right state of mind. In in the Sharia, we look at in the right state of mind. Um, uh, the state of mind can affect rulings, right? Someone who's um, able to distinguish between uh, right and wrong, obligation and non-obligation. Is considered of sound mind so sometimes people come with questions about mental health people who are you know suffering from difficult situations like you know extreme depression and other scenarios so uh, and so because in uh, in some of the classical in the classical text it is say someone who's not of sound mind uh, the obligation of zakat and you know fasting these sorts of things don't apply so what what's the deciding factor so the deciding factor here is, does the person understand obligation? Uh, I have to pray, for example. And um, so if I pray, I get rewarded. If I don't pray, I could get punished. If they, if they understand that, if they can understand that, they have to pray. The same thing here in this situation. <clears throat> the man understands that if I write out the statement of divorce, uh, I will get some money. So his understanding, giving and receiving, his understanding, like with a sale, for example, a p purchase purchasing something means I give money away, I don't see that money again, but I receive this item. Understanding this is sufficient to establish that the person is of sound mind in this regard. It doesn't mean, you know, the mental health and there could be other forms of stress or whatever. But in this situation, she said, uh, give me a divorce and I will give you a certain amount of money. So when he wrote that divorce in front of people, yes, it's a, it's a valid divorce. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, knows best. I want to know if you're sinful for not checking every single ingredient <clears throat> when purchasing something. Um, you're expected to take reasonable measures. And <clears throat> in the West, you know, God bless the vegetarians. <laughs> they made life and the vegans. They made life easy for us Muslims. So generally, what do we need to do? <clears throat> Generally, uh, what makes something uh, impermissible? The, the presence of unslaughtered meat, right? Or the presence of uh, wine. They're generally the two things that would make uh, something. Or uh, with along with unslaughtered meat, you can say blood and these sorts of things, right? So let's just put all that into one category. Uh, so animal products, unslaughtered animal products. Um, and uh, what's the other one? It's um, it's wine. So if you look at something that says suitable for vegetarians here in the West, that's half the job done. 
uh, remember that categorization, you, something's only classed as being su suitable for vegans or vegetarians. If it's not only if the ingredients are suitable, but also if it's prepared in a place where there can't be any cross contamination with uh, uh, with meat products. So there's a there's another buffer, another you know buffer there. So if you are, if it's suitable for vegetarians, and if you look and there's no wine in it, <clears throat> like some types of you know cakes or whatever, uh, or, you know they, they may put some wine in there. So if it's these two things, then uh, if they're absent, then it, it's, it's permissible. If it's suitable for vegetarians without any wine, then generally it, it's it's going to be permissible. As for checking every single thing. Uh, no, you don't have to. If you do have a, re there are certain uh, codes that are, you know that regularly come up. You know, so E four seven one, for example, that used. You know, I knew that one when I was six or something, right? So there are certain codes that that <coughs> that can either be from <clears throat> a source that is uh, animal based or non animal based. So if you say suitable suitable for veg vegetarians, no wine in it, you're all right. If it doesn't say that, there are certain companies like Nestle, they don't put the, that on. If you really want the product, there are some numbers that you're not aware of, then it's quite easy to check. There's there's websites, I believe in the UK, there's a website called foodguide.org. And it's some scholars who go up and they actively research these matters. And you can just do a quick cross check there. Um, uh, but, you know, it's, it's something that you, you should take reasonable steps for. And, but what do i by what do i mean by reasonable sometimes people go to the other extreme and they start you know there's this alcohol and that alcohol and this and they were checking everything and it, it makes their life difficult here it's a case of ocd they have obsessive compulsive disorder and because normal people can you know function and go and buy things just with these broad criteria and it's sufficient so you're not expected to go check every single bit of you know every single ingredient every single time on every single product they might have changed but no generally if something's changed you find out right okay so allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best okay so the question can we sell an item that we do not own uh, generally no right but there's a condition here so, so generally let's say your neighbor's wearing a coat you can't take a picture of that coat sell it on ebay and then when you got payment for it say to your neighbor here i'll buy that coat off you right <laughs> you can't do that right you can't sell something that you don't have possession of however there is a there is a type of of uh, contract that is permissible and it's simple so what you what's now called drop shipping is quite similar to that so that would be permissible if you just check our archives the answers archives there there's a couple of answers there explaining drop shipping and how it works so if it fulfills those conditions that would be permissible thank you for listening this podcast was brought to you by seekers guidance the global islamic seminary visit seekersguidance.org to access reliable islamic knowledge taught by qualified teachers we offer a wide range of courses, podcasts, articles, and a world-class answer service. Support us in spreading free, reliable Islamic knowledge to millions around the world by becoming a monthly supporter. Visit seekersguidance.org forward slash donate and make a small monthly commitment today. Our beloved Prophet wasallam said, whoever guides someone to goodness will have a similar reward. So don't forget to share this podcast and spread prophetic guidance.